Welcome to our presentation on therapeutic applications of light. I'm Anadi Martel. I'm a physicist by training. I'm president of Sensotech Inc. in Canada. And I've been doing research on light and health for over 30 years. I'm also president of the International Light Association, which regroups researchers from all around the world working on um, therapeutic applications of light. And um, the association creates international conferences every year since 2003. And those conferences have had the opportunity to meet many of the pioneers in the fields, and I'll be presenting some of them to you today. So let's start by looking at the different action pathways in which light acts on us. And there are a few. Um, light has always been, of course, a major sense for us. Uh, it is said that over 80% of our sensorial input comes from vision, from light. And we've always been fascinated by the beauty of pure colors. It's really built in our genes. The, um, the Greek, the ancient Greeks, for example, had uh, a goddess, Iris, who was um, traveling on the rainbow and she was bringing people from the world um, of the living to the world of the dead, of the beyond, over the rainbow. So the rainbow has always been a symbol, these colors, these pure colors have always been a symbol for some kind of higher reality. And um, light and color has been used by all ancient civilizations as a source of um, healing. So this is nothing new at all. If you look at um, Egypt, Greece, India, Tibet, and closer to us, Europe, there's always been different traditions of using light and colors in various ways. Class, um, from the 19th century onward, um, people started to create more systematic ways of working with light for healing. Uh, so we had pioneers like Babbitt in the 19th century and closer to us again in the 20th century. People like Dinsha or Spittler who created um, complete healing systems uh, of chromotherapy uh, or using colors for therapy. And some of these systems are still in use today, are still actively used and, and uh, thought, such as uh, Dinsha's spectrochrome and Spittler's syntonics optometry. And it's interesting to see um, how highly regarded light medicine was um, as recently as early 20th century when you realize that uh, one of the very first medicine Nobel Prizes, the second one in 1903, was awarded to Dr. Niels Ryberg Finsen uh, for his work on curing uh, lupus vulgaris, a form of skin tuberculosis, with light. In those days, there were very few treatments um, that could cure uh, such diseases. And Finson pioneered the use of light, studied different spectrums, um, and um, got the Nobel Prize for that. Things changed after that. Uh, from the 1920s onward came what we could call the dark age of light therapy. And um, this was brought about by the rise of uh, pharmaceutical medicine, the discovery of antibiotics and uh, cures that w were much more um, rapid uh, than light to, um, to heal. So that caused a, a decrease in interest in uh, slower methods uh, such as light. And it actually um, led to, in fact, uh, even uh, condemnation of light. There was an active uh, suppression of light medicine in the 30s and 40s uh, for example, by the FDA in the United States. And light medicine was very much uh, um, forgotten for much of the 20th century. Uh, and that has started to change uh, very recently, from around 2000 onwards, for different reasons, which we will be talking about. And um, here is a little graph showing an increase in the number of scientific articles related to light therapy that have been published. If you look uh, back in the 1980s, 90s, there were very few. And then suddenly around 2000, it starts to accelerate. And up to the point where now there are literally thousands of scientific articles 
clinical studies being published every year on the use of light in medicine. So light medicine is really undergoing a, a real uh, renaissance currently. Um, so the, let's look at the different ways in which light acts. So the, the most obvious pathway, of course, is vision. Uh, this is uh, the main influence of light on us. It allows us through the visual system to, uh, to see the external reality, to create an image of the world, and um, this is achieved through light coming in the, the, the eye, uh, being transformed in the retina into electrical signals that are carried away through the optic nerve uh, to the occipital region of the brain, in the visual cortex in the back of the brain, where these signals are transformed into what we perceive as um, vision of the world. Uh, this is brought about by, in the retina, uh, cones and rods, sensitive cells. And um, the cones have three primary colors, red, blue and green. And this is very important in the way we use light. We'll see that later on as well. Now, from um, early on, there was some suspicion that there was more actually to the visual system than the, this visual pathway. Uh, already since the 1940s, uh, pioneers such, such as uh, Dr. Fritz Hollwich um, had uh, discovered that there was what uh, he called at the time the energetic pathway, um, or what's called now the non-visual optic pathway or non-image forming pathway. So this is another branch of the optic nerve that links directly the retina to the hypothalamus, the deep central portion of the brain that regulates our hormones and our inner balance, uh, the autonomous nervous system. So this is an entirely different pathway, it's separate from the visual system, which has a very deep effect on us from light. Very important when we uh, explore uh, light therapy. And um, this is very recent, it's only in 2001-2002 that uh, this uh, system has been definitely identified and um, specific cells separate from the rods and cones have been discovered, the, the IPRGCs, which uh, mediate uh, this link between light and the apothalamus. And we now know that um, these um, IPRGC cells are especially sensitive to the blue part of the light spectrum. Um, so the blue light has an uh, especially powerful role to play in our hormonal balance. Now this connection to the hypothalamus um, again links light with many of the, the deep structures uh, inside the brain. The, uh, the thalamus, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, our internal clock, uh, the pineal gland and uh, so through these um, light has a deep influence on our circadian rhythm uh, on neuroendocrine and neurobehavioral regulation it's a very powerful effect of light now even separate from these visual uh, effects uh, through through the eye uh, light acts directly on our skin on, on our cells you could think that light only reaches the surface of the skin and uh, stops there, but in fact, if you look uh, more closely, you see that light penetrates quite deeply uh, in the skin. You can, s if you simply look at your hand, uh, if you shine a red light through your hand, you will see it coming out uh, at the other end as a glow. So you can see that light penetrates many centimeters through uh, the surface of the body. And can then shine and act on cells deep within our body. So this is another very important action pathway of light directly on cellular biology. And um, it, we now know that uh, light is a key factor in uh, production of energy within the cells through mitochondria. Um, and we will be talking about that a little more shortly because it's very absolutely fascinating subject. 